XARC 13th Experimental Archaeology Conference, Turun, Poland, Monday, May 1st, 2023. Rediscovering the process of making type 2 and type 3 aglets by Gerald A. Livings. Good morning. My name is Gerald Livings, Jerry, and I will be your host for the next 15 minutes. A bit about myself, I am a professional bench jeweler, which means that I'm the guy in the back of the jewelry store making and repairing jewelry. I am also an independent researcher of historical jewelry manufacturing processes. I work to share my knowledge and skills with anyone I can through videos, blogs, print, and personal education. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself what this has to do with experimental archaeology because sometimes we have to experiment to learn about the past. Essentially, we deconstruct something before we can reconstruct it and learn from that reconstruction. My ongoing project is the study of aglets and how they fit into and affect the material cultures they are found in. This area of study is underexplored by scholars. Due to this, I have had to do truly original research into the field. I intend to continue my work exploring the socio-cultural and historical contexts of the aglets that I study. Experimental archaeology is a large part of this research. They are social, the way people lived and what they believed when the aglet I am examining was made and used. Cultural, the arts and popular interests associated with a particular time and place, also when the aglet I am examining was made and used, and historical. What was happening in the world when the aglet I am examining was made and used? I would like to point out that my 2017 monograph, Aglets, Medieval, Post-Medieval, and Modern, is already being used as a reference on the Portable Antiquities Scheme website. I am going to break this into sections and tie each one into experimental archaeology as I go. First, what are aglets? Second, the tools and supplies needed to make aglets. Third, adhesives get their own section. Fourth, and finally, making type 2 and type 3 aglets. What are aglets? Lace tags, aglets, aglets spelled with an I are all terms describing items that are in some way used to finish the ends of laces, such as shoelaces, thongs, or cords. Aglets still are in use today, in the 21st century, where they are utilitarian as well as decorative elements on laces for shoes, corsets, and other clothing. Many people recognize the plastic and metal ends on their shoelaces as modern aglets. Aglets from the medieval era would not have been much different from the plastic ones of today. Such a common item would have been manufactured in large quantities and as such would be made with a very efficient manufacturing process. The time frame I will be speaking about today ranges from about 800 common era to about the late 16th century. Each type of aglet has its own unique manufacturing process. The current typology describes six types of aglets. To learn more about this, visit my website where I have plenty of resources to learn about the typology of aglets. I also have links to videos about making aglets. Today I will be speaking of only type 2 and type 3 aglets. In the two types of aglets I will be discussing today, the definition is focused on functions such as protecting the cord from unraveling, easing passage through an eyelet of some sort, or adding weight to the cord. I am going to state that for my research that an aglet is a separately constructed object that is added to a cord or lace. Type 2 aglets have both sides of the seam folding inward to grip the cord or lace along the majority, 75% or more, of the seam. Type 3 aglets have an overlapping seam where one side of the aglet overlaps the other side along with the majority of the seam. One side of the seam may or may not 
the bent end to hold the cord or lace. The tools and supplies needed to make aglets. It takes only a few tools to make aglets. For type 2 and type 3 aglets, this would include sheet metal, probably copper, pliers, shears, some sort of adhesive, a small hammer, and a specialized anvil. A metal one is preferable, but one made from bone would work as well, as well as marking and measuring tools. Many of the tools I made myself. A question I wanted to answer when I started my research was, were pliers used in the manufacturing of aglets? As a jeweler, I thought they would leave too many tool marks that would have to be removed later, thus creating more work. It turns out that the answer is, yes, pliers were used. And the answer is also, no, pliers were not used. Type 1 aglets are not made using pliers. Type 2 and Type 3 aglets are made using pliers. I had requested some pictures of aglets that had been used in a book illustration, and the curator of the museum where they were stored was able to locate the aglets in the illustration, but was unable to take detailed images. He graciously sent them to me for examination, but unfortunately they were too fragile and most of them did not make the trip halfway around the globe. A tragedy from a preservation standpoint, it was a stroke of good fortune for examination. On this particular aglet, only one side of the seam made the trip. This is the top section of the broken aglet. The top of the aglet is on the right and the seam is on the bottom of the image. I believe the image shows that pliers were used during the manufacturing of this single type 2 aglet. The inner surface having been protected from polishing, wear, and corrosion, clearly shows marks left by tools during the manufacturing process. The edge has a pattern of bends suggesting it was folded over the openwork lace, then crimped several times along its length by a small set of needle nose pliers to tightly grip before the aglet was bent into a round shape. My experiments have supported this hypothesis. It was not until only a few decades ago that we understood metallurgy enough to differentiate brass from bronze. Mixing my own alloys from copper with unknown secondary elements seemed to be an invitation to have unknown variables creep into my work, so I chose to find something that would have been available to people in medieval Europe during the last two millennia. For this presentation, I felt it would be appropriate that I start as close to scratch as possible. So considering the previous comment and the fact that I do not have the facilities to refine metal ore, I obtained a quantity of native copper from the Keweenaw Peninsula located in the state of Michigan, USA. Native copper was great to work with because I could skip the refining stage and jump right into making billets. Modern billets are lengths of metal with square or circular cross sections and can be made to any size to suit the specifications of the client. In the past, I suspect that this would be much the same. They would have been made depending on what the customer needed. I need to investigate the metals trade in medieval Europe some more but I suspect that the craftspeople making the aglets would have probably forged these into sheets of metal themselves, a very time-consuming task. Due to time constraints, I chose to use a modern rolling mill instead of forging out the copper into a sheet. I do not feel this would have affected my results in any significant way. The subject of adhesives is a complex subject. I have spoken with several people about them and have experimented with making some. Casein glue from cheese, Theopolis, eggs, and various mixtures with pine resin. I have found in many extent aglets that there is some sort of resinous material inside, many times that still holds remnants of cords. I suspect that most of these are based around a resin or pitch type base. Other adhesives may have been used, but may not have survived centuries of being buried or exposed to water. 
I was able to find many very general and non-specific recipes for different adhesives. A popular mixture still used today is called cutler's resin, mainly used for knife handles. This is a pine resin based adhesive. There is no hard and fast recipe or mixture that I could find that was documented in the past. So I tried several mixtures with pine resin, including ground up organic material. All the mixtures I tried worked well, but it seems the mixture with about 20% by weight with ground up charcoal was a bit stiffer. This is the extant type two aglet I was trying to replicate. This would be for a very fine cord. Notice the material inside of the aglet. Most of the type two aglets in my collection are quite small. I suspect that these were used on woven lace or more delicate items many times. Type two aglets are made around the cord or lace that they are on. They require bending the metal of the blank over each side of the lace. This is done by pre-bending the edges up. Once this is done, place some melted adhesive inside the aglet blank and press the cord into the adhesive while it is still warm. I have tried this with casein glue and it does not work nearly as well. Using an adhesive that requires a bit of heat works much better. Once the lace is in the metal blank, I then crimped the metal edges over the cord or lace to secure it then shaped the metal in the grooves of the anvil to make it round. At this point, I had a finished type two aglet. This was repeated for the other end of the cord to make a completed point, a cord with two aglets. Thanks, shoelace. Type three aglets are also made around the cord, but may only crimp on one side. For a type three aglet, the metal blank should be the same width as for type two aglets. The reason for this is due to only crimping one edge. The cord will not want to compress inside the metal as it does with a type two aglet and will want to stick out past the metal edge. So I needed to allow for this. I started by only bending up one edge of the metal. You can see in, in the illustration that there are two options for making type three aglets. One, the metal does not crimp the cord and two, where the metal does crimp the cord. I chose to make these where the edge is crimping the lace. Only one edge turned up. I found it worked well to bend the edge into more of a J shape so that I could tuck the cord under this edge. Carefully add your adhesive and while warm, press your cord under the edge of the metal. Try to keep the adhesive off of your hands as it is very sticky. I carefully crimped the metal edge around my cord, then shaped it in the grooves of the anvil to make it round. When I was done rolling the metal around the cord in much the same way as making type two aglets, I had a completed type three aglet. This was repeated for the other end to make a completed point. In summary of what I spoke about today, first, it does not take a lot of tools to make aglets. These would have been easily available to craftspeople of the past. The earliest I have been able to document aglets in Europe is about 800 common era. Second, I have learned that adhesives would have been an important part of making type two and type three aglets. I conjecture that radiocarbon dating of this material might help with narrowing down the era of archaeological sites where they are found. Third, aglets are easily made and may provide clues to the economy and life of the people who used them. Fourth, with experimental archaeology, we can test our archaeological hypotheses through the process of deconstruction and then the reconstruction of a process. It is through this process I am working to discover how aglets fit into and affect the material cultures they are found in. I would like it very much if all of you could visit the XARC website for more information and to download a copy of this presentation. This will also be available on my website as well as the ResearchGate website. Does this presentation contain information that might be valuable and benefit your audience? 
If so, please share this among your professional and social networks. I really appreciate all of you taking time out of your day to attend my online presentation. As always, if you have any thoughts, comments, or suggestions, or corrections, I would love to hear them. Please feel free to contact me at glivings at livingstonjewelers.com.